So this is gonna be part one of my pretty good house build. So a few updates for you. The water wheel, I'm gonna post one more video on that. I have to assemble everything, but I do have all of the parts that are needed. So I'm gonna assemble it, show you how it should be, and then tear it all down because I don't wanna leave all that stuff with the house, which we haven't sold yet. It's a hot one today, 85 degrees, end of September, yeah, in Pennsylvania. This is not a how-to video, this is a my experiences video. I can quote uh, Pure Living for Life for that. They're another good YouTube channel, the couple, they're over in Idaho building their own house. I did not build this house, at least the outside of it. The, we had a contractor come in and do all the outside work and I'm doing all of the inside work. All right, I moved to the shade, it's a lot nicer. See all the nice woods? Yeah. <clears throat> Reasons why we're moving here and selling our old house where the water wheel is, um, we're a lot closer to work. If you look back there, that's our business and here's gonna be our house. Now our old house was, or is, 20 minutes away, one way. So that's 40 minutes a day driving. My wife works six days a week, she's a veterinarian. That's four hours a week just driving. And that doesn't account the risk from heavy snowfall, other travel associated risks, deer, <laughs> lots of deer. So these are some of the reasons for building instead of buying a place. First off, it's, it's industrial, industrial, that's what we're zoned here. There's other industrial over there. There's one house across the street that guy's never selling. We kind of wanted to live really close, but there's no places that are really close for sale that are also nice, efficient, comfortable. So we're building. Another benefit to building is all my tools because I'm a handyman, the maintenance guy, the IT guy, the tech guy, you know, everything for the business, the veterinary hospital, I take care of. And I can't easily take care of that if all of my tools are 20 minutes away. Now they're all gonna be right here. Another reason for doing this is I really wanted to experiment on green building. I've been following green building sort of stuff for many years now, probably close to a decade. Things like passive house, super insulation, airtight, all of those things are very important to me, but I've never had any experience with that and I wanna do it myself. So that's another huge reason for building that I get to do all that myself. And you can't really do that properly with an existing structure around here. They're all just, they're not great. They're not great candidates for that sort of construction or renovation. So what I'm gonna be building is called a pretty good house, which is one step below passive house and like two steps above code. And a, a huge reasoning for me doing all of this also is that I'm a degreed mechanical engineer. I don't actually use my engineering degree right now though. Uh, so all of this stuff is really close to heart, all of the efficiency improvements. So what is a pretty good house? It, a pretty good house is a house that's better than code. It's super insulated, it's super airtight, but it doesn't include a lot of the stuff that are associated with a passive house. Now a passive house, they, they try to reduce their heating load to zero and they use solar, you know, solar power, lots of sun and a lot of insulation, but Solar panels, mm, they're a lot cheaper now. So instead of paying money for super insulation, which is unconventional around here, what you do is you build very good, not, you know, like super insulated, and then you add solar panels and that offsets your heating cost. Another benefit of this method is, or at least my implementation of it is, there's no combustion inside. I'm gonna use electric for everything. Another nice thing about a pretty good house is all conventional materials. Conventional insulation, conventional installation methods, everything is standard. So I don't pay any extra money for unknowns or pain in the ass sort of stuff with a contractor. And luckily we got a pretty good contractor who was willing to go along with the few specific changes that I wanted him to implement. So a few specific site details is that it's south facing primarily and we have a nice cross breeze. There's, you can't hear it now because I have the dead cat on the microphone 
but there's a good cross ventilation that we could open the windows and it cools down quite nicely if it weren't 85 degrees out. Another key thing about this building is that it's the right size. It's 24 foot deep and 42 foot long and the 42 foot long or wide face is south facing. So we do get lots of sun on that south face. And like I said, it's simple, it's rectangular. The, the only access is a stair access through the porch on the outside. There's no inside stairs that will break the envelope. So it's literally just a rectangular box. Very simple to detail. One thing I didn't mention earlier is the overhangs. They're larger than normal. And in the middle of summer, they do block the sun completely. But here at the end of September, we're getting a lot of heat and the sun's getting really low in the sky. So we do get a little bit of sun coming in the house. The second story addition to this garage was only about $38,000. We spent an additional twelve dollars or $13,000 on the back porch, which is really nice living space. And now I'll go over some of the framing details. Those are energy heel trusses. So you see how it goes vertical before the angled part? That's to allow a lot of extra insulation down here at the edge of the truss. And that'll, that'll keep ice dams from forming and also allow us to have a lot of extra insulation in that area. Or not, not have extra insulation, but have the proper amount of insulation, whereas most houses around here don't have the proper amount of insulation. So that's the huge issue for a lot of houses around here. You can't change that after the fact unless you add like six inches of insulation on top of your roof plane. I chose to go with normal two by four studs, first because it's cheap, and the second is we have a fixed footprint and I wanted to increase our square footage as much as possible. So if we put two by six inch walls in, that would be additional two inches all the way around that we'd lose and the extra four inches would be really nice. Now, we didn't really get to do advanced framing, partially because the contractor was not going with it. The one thing that he did do, I don't know if he does this on all houses, but I did specifically request it, was a California corner. So normally they would frame this, they put one at the far corner and then the nailer stud here and the nailer stud here, and I'd leave a cavity back here. But if you angle the studs differently, then you have this gap here and you can easily just fill that with insulation. This is not a load bearing wall. The trusses go that way. Okay, well maybe it has a little bit of load bearing from the, the side wall, but not much. And really all of the headers could have been right sized. So you have just one header and then the rest of it is foam. Or you put a piece of foam between two headers or you can do something better than a solid header for insulating value. And our contractor wasn't really going with it. So it's not a huge deal, which for later reasons I'll explain works just fine. So far the only really special thing that we've had the contractor do is add five inches of insulation on the outside. This is polyisocyanurate foam, which is like R5 per inch. So five inches of that is R25 on the outside of the studs. So for that reason, our headers, they don't really matter. We already have R25 continuous on the outside of the header. So it's not a big deal. So once we get insulation in the ceiling, I expect very little noise to get through the walls and the windows and the ceiling and the floor. All right, let's go over some of the insulation values. The walls. R40 walls. Now a passive house would be like R60 plus walls. The ceiling, R60 to R70, which is going to be 20 inches of loose fill cellulose. And I forgot to mention a passive house ceiling would be about R80. The windows are Pella 350 triple pane K 
casement, and in this case, a fixed window. Now, a normal window around here, a code window, is going to be U of 0.3. That's like an R2 or R3, somewhere in there. These, at least this one is a U of 0.15, which is more like R6.5. And, and all of the other casement windows in this building are R6 and a third, which is U.16. The door is U of 0.2, which is like R5. I just picked this up at the home center. Um, I didn't special order the door. I did have to special order all of the windows. One big thing that we didn't do that passive house people do is that a lot of thermal mass. And that's to get your sun to carry you through the night. Or at least the sun's energy to carry you through the night. Second story here, I don't really have sufficient support to add thermal mass, so we don't have thermal mass. For heating, we're going to have four sources of heat. The first primary source of heat is going to be a mini split. Now I'm getting a floor mount mini split here, and I think that'll be the best option for us because it's low and easy to service instead of having something up in the ceiling. And it's going to take in cool air from the bottom and then recirculate it. Whereas the mini split up here is taking in hot air and they're more efficient when they're operating closer to the outside temperature. So instead of drawing up here would be 70 degree air, it's drawing 67 degree air down here. So it, it doesn't have to start as hot. And when you start hotter, that's less efficient for these sort of heating systems. So the mini split I'm getting is a Halcyon, I guess that's what they call their line of mini splits, um, XLTH. And that stands for Extra Low Temperature Heating. The system, it's a mini split hit system, will heat down to an outside temperature of negative 15 at its at like 9,000 BTUs or something like that. Now our record temperature for low here is like negative 22. And that's only in the dead of night for only a few hours. So as long as we can coast through that, we'll be all right. Now it is rated at 12,000 BTUs of heating at five degrees Fahrenheit, which is coincidentally the heating, what is it? So, 5 degrees is the design temperature for around here. That's, you want, that's what you want to base your BTU loss or B, BTU transference amounts on. So, 68 inside, 5 outside. And these are all in degrees Fahrenheit. A, an added benefit of, it, of a mini split is we get air conditioning. It's built in. So, I don't have to deal with this 85 degree in September crap. The second source... The second source of heat is going to be a baseboard heater in our bedroom. And that's going to be a small one for the super cold nights. If we're not here, you know, if we're out at the movies, we're not in the room, it'll keep it nice and warm for us. And I really don't think that that's going to be necessary. Like we'll have our, our set temperature in the house at 65 or something. And I'll set that thermostat at like 62. And if it gets below 62 in the bedroom, then it'll kick on. Our third source of heat is going to be in the bathroom. We're going to have heated tile floor. That's more of a luxury thing. That's not a heating related thing, but I figure I should mention it. The fourth source of heat is everything that's already in the building. And that's going to be the refrigerator, the water heater, all of the dogs, all of the humans, the, the AV equipment, my server, some uh, networking equipment, the, the sun, <laughs> forgot about the sun. So I did some calculations and we're gonna have like thousands of BTUs worth of heat coming in during the winter from the sun, at least when it's sunny. And that's gonna be super beneficial on the coldest days of the year because around here, when, it, when the high is zero degrees Fahrenheit, I guarantee it's gonna be sunny because there is no clouds overnight to keep all of the heat in. So all the heat left because it's clear. So it's gonna be clear on those coldest days 
and we're going to get a lot of extra heat from that for free. Now, some people think that the floor should be dark and massy, you know, having a lot of thermal mass to absorb that heat. I think not. I think once the heat gets into the building, it's not like it's going to bounce off the floor and out the windows, which very little of it will. Yes, it can, but very little of it. So the heat's going to bounce off the floor and just radiate all over everything and heat everything evenly. So a few other details about the mini split. If it ran continuously, full bore, for a month, it would only cost $115 a month. Now compare that with our average natural gas heating bill at our old place is like $250 a month just for heating. So even if we run it at you know, half of duty, we're only going to spend 60 bucks a month on heating total. The mini split is also a modulating model. So if it only needs you know, 3,000 BTUs of heat, and then it puts out 3,000 BTUs of heat. It doesn't run full bore. So you get a lot more efficient operation out of that sort of system. So now I move on to ventilation, which is the second part of HVAC, heating, ventilation, air conditioning. Already covered heating, already covered air conditioning. Ventilation is removing all of the stale air in the building. So a few things that I have to preface this with. First, during the summer, we have the windows open primarily. Or if the AC is on, it's only going to be for a few hours. So we're not going to need any ventilation during all of the summer. But during the winter, it's going to get stale and stuffy and uncomfortable. You know, if you're cooking, you have a lot of guests over, there's a lot of smells, the dogs. So we need some sort of ventilation method. Now, a lot of houses, they used to think, oh, a house has to breathe. Well, I, I take that as seeing a house is going to leak. So you have a leaky house and you have drafts and you have just a, an uncomfortable building. So what we do, or what I'm going to do, is something called an ERV, an energy recovery ventilator. And that's going to be mounted somewhere around here. That's why I'm waving my arm over here. Uh, this is going to be the south wall. In the winter, if there's sun, the south wall is going to heat up. And that's going to temper our incoming air a little bit. And that will help during the winter for efficiency. The, the energy recovery ventilator is a heat exchanger. You have your fresh air coming in and your exhaust air leaving. And they transfer the heat. And in the case of an energy recovery ventilator, as opposed to a heat recovery ventilator, you get a little bit of moisture transference too, like 60% or so. So your incoming air is heated with the exhaust air and also absorbs some of the moisture. And provides the whole house with warmed, moist, fresh air, whereas colder, stale exhaust air is leaving. The energy recovery ventilator that I'm going with is a Panasonic IntelliBalance FV-10VEC1. Now that requires uh, 62 watts continuous when it is running but it also has a timer if you're not going to be here, if you want like a lower duty cycle, you can have it run like half the time or whatever, and even lower speeds, I think. Or maybe that is the minimum speed, I'm not sure. That'll have absolutely no problems down to minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit, at which point the defrost, it does a defrost cycle. <laughs> That's fine. That works for us. Now, the heat exchanger that's going to be back there, we're going to have a supply into the bedroom and a supply into the living room and then an exhaust over the kitchen area and another exhaust in the bedroom. So, so the heat exchanger will take care of our bath fan too. Now I'm going to quickly go over some of the BTU requirements that I calculated for all of our walls, windows, doors, ceiling, and roof, or ceiling and floor. R40 walls, 1,477 BTUs. Now this is heating up to 68 degrees Fahrenheit inside with a 5 degree temperature outside. Ceiling, 896 BTUs. Floor, 1,493 BTUs. Windows, 1,228 BTUs. Door, 278 BTUs. So we ended up with needing only 5,400 BTUs to heat on a five degree day. 
And as you recall, our mini split is going to do 12,000 BTUs. So we have a lot of extra overhead for when it gets really cold. Another heating factor is going to be air infiltration and heating loads due to the heat exchanger. Now I calculate all of these is going to be like in the low hundreds total. So we have plenty of overhead with our mini split to cover all of that. Air sealing is a huge thing for a lot of houses. And this is going to be, I hope, an air, a super airtight house. A passive house, they aim for 0 0.06 air changes per hour at 50 pascals. Now at 50 pascals, they pressurize the house with a fan and they measure how many CFM are leaving the house. And they pressurize it to 50 pascals of pressure, which simulates a 20 mile an hour wind blowing on all surfaces of the house at the same time. So a, a passive house would be 0 0.6 air changes per hour. That means 0 0.6 of the house volume has leaked out in an hour. And I'm gonna aim for one, 1 1.2 reasonably. And the only way I'm gonna be able to do that is by focusing on detailing any of the leaky areas. Things like the windows. We chose casement windows for a very specific reason. There's one, two, three seals. So that allows us to have a very airtight window as opposed to like double hungs or, mm, I, I, I don't know, other less efficient window types. Most windows are more efficient than double hungs when it comes to air sealing. Now I'll go over a few of the special details about all of our windows. And a, a key thing about this house is it being site aware. Now behind me that's south and east over there is a large window. This is more of a southeast and it's going to get a lot of morning sun in the winter. Now, back over there is kitchen. So we can't really put a, a window there. And this is predominantly south. It's like a little bit 15 degrees west of south. And you see, you know, a big window, a picture window, a big window, a big window, a big window. Yeah. So we have a lot of south facing large glass. We have on the west wall behind me over there is a window that matches the east uh, mold windows together. And there's another one over there. And this is for ventilation purposes. So we have a lot of cross ventilation through those windows. And the front windows are actually situated such that the upwind window, you can open it out and it'll draw air in. The downwind window, you open it up and it'll try to exhaust air out. Now, the north wall of windows or of a building should have small windows. And you see back there is the north wall, the north bedroom wall window. And it's just a small awning window. In the bathroom is another small, smallish window. Unfortunately, we put the door on the north wall. That's, that's where our porch is. You can't really get around that. And the kitchen windows are also smaller than all the other windows, again, on the north wall. And these are also situated such that you get uh, a natural ventilation draw from them. The bathroom window opens up such that the, the natural uh, airflow in this area, this acts as more of an exhaust. At least that was my initial plan. I think I feel that it, at least in the evenings, cool air flows down the mountain and then this turns as an intake, but that's okay. I'm standing here in front of the laundry area because a, a huge place where a lot of air leaks in a house is going to be the dryer vent. Now, we're going to put one in only because I, I don't want to try finding or dealing with a heat pump dryer. Ultimately, I want to put in a heat pump dryer, but I also want to you know, provide for a conventional dryer. I don't want to make this house useless for somebody that has conventional needs. You know, I'm factoring in resale value here if we ever do want to sell this place. Other sources of air infiltration or openings in the house, we're going to have the heat exchanger vent which is gonna be one six inch tube and it has you know, two ducts in it. So that's one opening. We have the dryer vent, that's a second opening. We have the hood exhaust. We like to cook a lot. 
So we want like a sufficient exhaust, an actual execute your vent exhaust, none of that carbon exhaust bullshit. I don't think they work. Well, they, they do work somewhat, but not, they, they don't flow enough air for our smoky type of cooking. We like to sear steaks and that sort of thing. The subfloor, I want to coke all of these seams and that'll prevent any sort of air infiltration from the floor. Other seams I want to address is any seam here that's along the plywood for the OSB. And I want to caulk all, or not caulk, but spray foam out of the can, you know, the professional can, um, all of the seams around all of the studs, just to try to like air seal everything. In the whole house, we're going to try to minimize any sort of ceiling penetrations. And the ones that we do have for like can lights, um, well, we're going to use the LED flush lights. So they use like a, a tiny J box, and then I'm going to build a box around that and then foam it all and then glue the drywall to that. So it's going to be an airtight penetration in the ceiling. And we're going to try to minimal those. We're going to have sconces on the walls instead. And our air sealing barrier is going to be the OSB. So anything that's in the wall, the outlets, the switches, the sconces, those don't have to be super airtight. There's a few things I would have done differently. The first one is the overhangs. I wish I had specified, especially in the very beginning, to have larger overhangs all the way around. Also, the contractor somewhat screwed up on the ends and he forgot to order the shorter uh, gable ends so that your roof, um, I guess in this case, there'd be two by fours. You could span over that gable wall by, you know, you have your 24 inches to, this, to the wall and then another 24 inch overhang, which is what I really wanted. And we have more like 16 inches, which uh, allows more driving rain to get in the, uh, the west bedroom windows if they're open. Also, I didn't specify enough overhang for the porch here. So this railing gets a little bit wet if there's wind driven rain or nearly any amount of rain. So that kind of sucks. As for the window sizes, I think all of the window sizes are really good, except the bedroom awning window. I do wish it was about two sizes larger and a little bit lower. These Pella 350 windows, they're this window and the window on the east wall, they're mulled together. So this is a separate window that are, they're like heat welded together. And the way they do that for the mulled windows with these corner caps is just, I don't know, kind of crappy. I don't like that. So maybe next time I wouldn't have gotten mulled windows. Maybe here I would get like a large awning window I, I don't know, something like that. Another thing I should have specified when the contractor was doing the framing was to angle the window opening like 45 degrees. So maybe put the header, extend the header over and your all your jack studs and whatever would be here. And then I could trim in an angle here so the sun isn't like channeled, it can more wash outwards. And that in an ideal situation would Provide better lighting for the entire room so we don't have to run as many you know ceiling lights or artificial lighting uh, it would also look kind of cool I've seen it done from other people doing similar houses and I really like how it looks so I've tried to cover everything that I could think of I have you know three pages here of points that I've gone over today um, if there's something that I noticed that I've missed or if there's other questions or comments or whatever you know I'll cover those in a future video one really nice thing that I specified when we were doing the plans of the contractor was to leave this corner unroofed. And that's so that we can have like our grill up here and this is the downwind side so any grill smoke is just going to go away. Um, we have the plants, they get more sun here than if they were under the porch. They get rain. And I don't know, I like this. This is like one of the favorite parts of this. Also we angled it because we're going to put a drive here. And if it was sticking out more than our drive would have to do more of a sharp bend um, between the edge of the deck here and there's a stream there which is also the property line so the deal with the contractor was that he does all the inside and the porch and i do all the inside work so future videos are going to cover me doing the inside work and a lot of the other site work such as taking care of large amounts of dirt that were moved the actual drive i'm also doing the 
the sewer work for a grinder pump up to the grinder pump and I'm having somebody else do the grinder pump and then the city tie-in of course they do that themselves the we're getting a new water line from the street so I'm also doing that I mean, I've gotten most of that dug at the report at the time of recording of this video as always don't forget to mash that thumbs up button down here and give me a comment you know tell me how I'm doing anything that I should have changed or done differently I, I appreciate those sort of comments and also, don't miss future videos of this series, please hit that subscribe button too.